Our scripture reading comes this morning comes from the Gospel of John. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. John 19, excuse me, John 20, 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas called Didymus. One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Will you pray with and for me? Jesus, we indeed rejoice at your resurrection, knowing that you have overcome the grave, and that you give us that same power. So Jesus, I pray that you would indeed use his stammering tongue to proclaim your message message of grace, of love, of joy, and of overcoming fear. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So there's a story about a young woman who is waiting for a bus in kind of an inner city area. It's a very rough part of the city. And uh, on this particular evening, as she was waiting for a bus, uh, a rookie policeman approached her and just simply asked, said, would you like for me to wait with you, he asked. And she replied, thank you, but that's not necessary, I'm not afraid. To which the rookie police officer said, well then, would you mind waiting with me? <laughs> you know, I've said it before, fear is powerful. Fear can make people do things they never thought they would do before. We see that in the scriptures. A week before Jesus' death and cru his crucifixion and subsequent re resurrection, a week before the, the disciples and all the other followers of Jesus, they were waiting palm branches in the air. They were laying their cloaks on the road. And they were shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You know, they were thinking, Jesus is the king of Israel. We're going to come in and take over. A week later, we find the disciples are in a room somewhere in Jerusalem. And the door is locked because they are afraid. They are afraid that since Jesus had been crucified, they could be next. 
These are the people who follow Jesus everywhere. They followed Jesus closer than anyone else. They walked with Jesus and they talked with Jesus. A long last merit way. They saw Jesus turn the water into wine. They saw Jesus give sight to the blind. They saw Jesus make the lame walk. They saw Jesus himself walk on the water. Casting out demons. Speaking to the storm to be calm. And it did. They witnessed it all. And yet they were afraid. You ever been afraid before? It says there in verses 19 through 20. On the evening of the first day of the week. When the disciples were together. With the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. The doors were locked. The disciples were in fear. And Jesus comes in, not through the door, by the way. He just appears and he says, peace be with you. There was an organization, safehome.org, that uh, did a survey the top 10 fears of Americans, and this is in 2023, just last year. This is what they came up with. Top 10 fears, a loved one dying, makes sense. A loved one becoming seriously ill. Personally becoming seriously ill. Another fear, not having enough money for retirement. Another one, mass shootings. Gun violence. Another one, losing physical mobility. Another one, corrupt government officials. Chronic diseases. A couple of high medical bills. And then the last one was the U.S. getting involved in another world war. My hunch is we could add to that list all day long. And I'm sure each of us have our fears. All of us have concerns. Hey, what if this happens? What if that happens? That's part of human nature. But I believe that the same words Jesus spoke to the disciples, Jesus can speak to you and me today. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. I don't mean to simply trivialize or just disregard our fears or our concerns. Yet if we are all in and following Jesus, we cannot let fear dominate us. Over and over in the Bible, God says to His people, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You will see that theme Throughout all of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, do not be afraid. Here's how John put it in his first epistle, 1 John chapter 4. He says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. You know, with God, we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to be afraid of anyone or anything. We know that Jesus lives and because He overcame the grave, guess what? He promised the same to you and I. When we think about God's peace in our lives, I almost always remember the words of Paul in Philippians 4, verse 7. I use it as a benediction many times. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I strongly believe that we can have a peace of the soul. Even when there's absolutely zero logical sense for having such peace. I've had the privilege of knowing people throughout 
my time in ministry, it just, it's not that they didn't have problems, although they did, but it just seemed like nothing ever rattled them. They, they had a peace. It's like, you would think, how can you be peaceful when your world is falling apart around you and you're just kind of like, chill all the time. Calm, cool, collected. I believe that it's the peace of God at work. Doesn't mean we don't have concerns. Doesn't mean we don't look around at the world and say, good gravy. Everything seems to be going down. But I believe that God can give us a peace that you really can't make sense of why we have it. You just have a peace. God's got this. Too often I think that you know we are running around afraid and living in fear of what might happen. That's true. Things could go wrong. Things could get really bad. But we need to remember that the kingdom is coming. Jesus is going to bring about the kingdom. And everything that is wrong with this world, he's going to change it and make it right. We can have peace with that. No matter what we face, no matter what adversity we face, God's love will never fail us. He's not going to turn his back on us. And he will sustain us through it. We can have peace with that. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever it is that's burdening you today, God can speak peace into the storms of your life. When we were in the uh, mountains in North Carolina serving churches there, we, we heard some interesting stories, as you hear pretty much anywhere you go, you'll hear stories. But I heard about these things called ramps. Now, I, I thought I knew what ramps was. Ramps was kind of one of those things you build uh, as a kid to ride your bike on and you do some jumps. No, that's not what ramps are. Ramps are a wild onion that grows in the mountains of North Carolina. I'm sure they probably grow elsewhere too. And, you know, we, we had a friend, Charlie Evans is his name, and, and he would say, look, this will take your meatloaf from being meatloaf to a meatloaf. He loved ramps. However, if you cooked them in something or with something, they were fine. But if you just decided... To eat them raw, everybody was going to know it. <laughs> Literally. I mean, we heard stories from more than one person. Yes, if you eat wild ramps and you don't cook them or anything, the kids would do this. They would, they would eat a ramp before school. Uh, within a few hours, the teacher would have them sitting in the hallway because literally you could smell it through the whole classroom. They could say, well, I was in school. <laughs> You sure didn't want to be around that, and I don't think, you know, 50 Tic Tacs is going to cover that up. You didn't want to be around somebody breathing on you and just eating ramps, for sure. I don't think Jesus had ramps right before he breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, he did breathe on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You know, the act of breathing on the disciples is meant to remind us of two passages primarily in the Old Testament. One coming from Genesis chapter 2. It says this, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord formed a man in the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. We're also meant to think of Ezekiel chapter 37. You remember the story of the Valley of the Dry Bones. Ezekiel was given a vision and he sees just a valley and, and all he sees is skeletons, basically. And God tells him, prophesy to the bones and 
and he does, and they start coming together and prophesy, or and flesh appears on the bones, but they are still not living. And then the Lord says, prophesy to the breath, to the spirit. And he does so, and the spirit of the Lord came into that, those, those bones, or those bones with flesh on it, and they became living again. And, he's, and the Lord said, this is the army of Israel. And the point of both of those passages is meant to understand that we require the spirits within us. In, in the Hebrew, it is called Ruach. And, and Ruach can mean your wind, it can mean breath, it can mean spirit. All three of those words. And if you think about what takes place in Acts chapter 2 with the coming of the Holy Spirit, if we think about Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones and the spirit coming into those who, were, who have been dead. And we think about Genesis chapter 2 when God breathes into the man and he becomes a living being. It is meant to remind us that without the Holy Spirit of God in you and in me, we are not ever going to be fully who God has called us to be. We need to experience the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul says, The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who, have been, who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit in us? Maybe we want to experience the love of God more on a deeper level. Maybe right now we need God's peace. That peace that rationally speaking may not make sense, but we know that God gives us peace nevertheless. Maybe we'd like to be able to do better with patience. I was always told, be careful if you pray for patience. God will give you an opportunity to practice it. Maybe it's joy. Do we have joy in our lives? Maybe we're needing to learn more self-control. You name it. The list goes on. I invite you to invite God the Holy Spirit to move in your life. Invite Him in. I think a lot of times we don't talk about the Holy Spirit very much in the United Methodist Church. I'm not sure why. I do. I'm not afraid of that. I think the reason is because, well, Holy Spirit's a little unpredictable. Harder to explain. It's part of the mystery of God. I don't think we can say, oh, I love God, the Father, and I love God, the Son, but the Holy Spirit, and just disregard. That's one third of who God is. We don't serve three gods. We serve one God. It's the three in one. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. He says to us that, he said, if you forgive someone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not, then they are not. What that means simply is this. Jesus is giving you and I, as Christians, to be the priesthood of all believers. That we have authority to pronounce forgiveness. Now, it doesn't say we have the authority to redefine what sin is, but we have the authority to pronounce God's love and forgiveness upon people. So my prayer 
And we're not going to have time to get into wonderful downing Thomas and all that. I really feel bad for Thomas. One instance, and he's forever scarred as downing Thomas. Never mind the other disciples, they didn't know what to think either. But my prayer is that we, as God's people, will be filled with God's Holy Spirit. That we would seek the direction of the Holy Spirit for this, His church. And that we would seek to give Him praise and glory. Because I think that's how we as a church grow. It's being willing to set our own agendas aside and saying the agenda we're going to have is God's Holy Spirit where He leads. And I'm not saying that we haven't done that in the past. But it's a call to be reminded of that. So I ask, is the Holy Spirit in you today? Is God's Holy Spirit moving in your life? If not, then let us pray and let us invite him in. Let's join together and let's pray. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for giving us the Holy Spirit. And God, if anyone here, if we have been seeking to be faithful, as a Christian, but yet be separate from the Holy Spirit. God convict us of that. Jesus, we pray, Lord, that you would come into our lives. We pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would move in us, stir in our souls, that we would seek you above all other things. Jesus, we give praise to you. Help us to be spirit-filled and spirit-led. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.